Thank you for joining today's webinar entitled Blockchain and Crypto, a Rational Dialogue. Today's presentation is being recorded. The webinar console allows you to customize your experience through actions like maximizing your slide window or setting it to full screen. Use the escape key to exit the full screen view. You can also minimize, resize, and move other windows to create a configuration that works best for you. You can op open up the Q&A tool from the dock at the bottom of your screen. You can enter a question at any time and click Submit. Now, welcome your host for today's webcast, Dan Sunderland. Thanks very much, and good afternoon or good morning to everybody. Um, my colleagues and I read a recent headline, Audit Dead in a Decade. And we read on, quoting Professor David Yermak, the distributed ledger reduces the need for audit by 97%. Well, such precision is laudable, but it's certainly not auditable. Uh, Professor Yermak went on to say, auditors in the future will be competing on the basis of productivity, which will essentially mean who has the fastest hardware and software. And fraud, fraud in the classical sense, will all be, will all be but impossible. This is certainly one of the number of extreme statements that we have heard over the last several years about blockchain and its influence on data and its integrity. And certainly closely linked to the blockchain concept is the idea of cryptocurrency, or perhaps more broadly, digital assets. And most of what we've heard about crypto and digital assets, especially from regulatory sphere, is concern again and again and again. Today we'd like to separate fact from fiction when it comes to both blockchain and digital assets and truly contemplate what these things are and what they're not. No, the sky's not falling. No, no digitized blockchain ledgers have no chance for placing the myriad of judgments that go into a set of financial statements. And no blockchain ledgers do not necessarily eliminate fraud, yet there are a number of benefits that can accrue from them. Today I'm joined by Amy Steele and Will Bible. Both Amy and Will are audit partners who are active in the blockchain and digital asset space. Will's been leading the blockchain technology charge the firm for the past three years, amongst many of the other technological innovations he's been working on. Amy, God bless her, has been tasked with trying to find audit solutions to the conundrums that blockchain and digital assets present. While the auditing standards have not changed as a result of this new technology, the techno technological challenges, technology challenges us to think hard about how to audit in this environment. So, Will, let's take a step back, and I'm going to ask you to be our chief historian and, and etymologist. Could you provide a brief history of blockchain and perhaps define the word for us? Sure. Thanks, Dan. And so let's talk a bit about what a uh, blockchain is. And you've used the word in your opening remarks, uh, ledger. And so if we go ahead and flip to the, the first slide, um, a, a blockchain at its fundamental core is a just a data storage um, technology. It is the ability to record transactions um, in a database that then is accessible by um, participants. Now, what's unique about a blockchain is that it has some certain properties that are different than traditional data storage. When we think about traditional databases, we think about uh, technology that's put in place by a person or a company and then controlled within that company. Uh, a blockchain uh, flips those concepts on their head. The idea behind a blockchain is to would actually distribute the data ledger. You would give it to as many uh, participants as possible in some cases it, with the goal of making sure that everyone has the same exact ledger and because those different participants are all competing, uh, they effectively cancel out the ability to change the ledger um, individually. The way that the blockchain achieves this is through a number of cryptographic techniques, which we'll talk about, um, and ways in which it links 
the data from one set of entries to the next set of entries, hence the, the term blockchain um, that actually forms the, the ledger. So at its very core, when we talk about blockchain, whether it's digital assets or cryptocurrency or some other implementation, what we're really talking about is data storage. Uh, it's a way to store information, in a, but it has different properties than traditional databases um, that we are all very used to. So what's, what's so different about a blockchain? Well, the fact that multiple people have the same copies means that um, the concept of control over that ledger is much different than when a single party controls a ledger. So that in and of itself is a, a radical change in the way in which we think about data storage. So how, you know, how is this achieved? Let's, let's flip to the, the next slide and we'll talk a little about the process by which information is entered into a blockchain because that becomes a, a very problematic uh, concept if everyone has a copy of the ledger. How do we decide who gets to put the next set of information into the ledger? Provided that ledger is keeping track of something at value, each party would have an interest in putting the next entry into that ledger. And so how do we create processes and systems and um, protocols that prevent people from defrauding the system and taking advantage of having a copy of that ledger? And so the way the blockchain works is that a uh, person try, uh, broadcasts a entry into the ledger to a community of users of the blockchain. That community of users then will run through a series of validation protocols, which are defined in the underlying software coding of that particular blockchain. And each implementation of a blockchain has different types of validations. Although you can imagine that in the case of a cryptocurrency, uh, a validation might be, is the wallet which is trying to transfer funds from itself to another wallet, do those funds exist in the initial wallet? Or is it going negative? Another set of validation might be, does this wallet exist? And, and does the target wallet exist? So the community at large will receive all the broadcasted transactions um, over the internet or, or some other network. They will run the validations on those transactions and they will come to a consensus of which groups of transactions are valid transactions under the protocols of that blockchain. And once they reach that consensus, those transactions are cemented into a block and entered into the ledger and they're recorded. So there's a whole lot more complexity than to figure out well, who actually performs that task. And we can get into lots of detail on, on mining and, and cryptocurrencies and rewards for performing this set of validations. But in general, you're relying on a distributed community, community to build consensus that a series of transactions are valid. And once they are valid, they are posted to the ledger. And importantly, you use cryptographic techniques to link one block to the next. So once a block has been recorded to the ledger, if you try to change that block retrospectively, it would then mess up every subsequent block to it. And so in that way, there is a daisy chaining effect amongst the blocks. So once everyone's agreed, it's recorded to the ledger, it's locked in cement, and the network is updated, and now we have a distributed ledger in which everyone has the same transactions, and there's no way to go back in time and change them. And so that fundamentally is what a blockchain is, Dan. Thanks, Will. A Amy, maybe you could just clarify things, because I, I always get confused about this. And, and what, what, what's the difference between blockchain and crypto? Are, are they different? Could you maybe embellish on, on that, that thought for, for a few minutes? Sure, Dan, and you're not alone. I mean, we often see the terms blockchain and crypto used um, in, in the same context when they are very different. So as Will said, blockchain, it's the technology. It is the, the underlying technology that enables this real-time settlement of transactions. It allows parties to transact directly with each other through this single distributed ledger. It's a technology. The cryptocurrency side of it, this is the, the medium of exchange. So it's a digital or virtual medium of exchange that's created to move the transaction on that blockchain technology. So the, the blockchain technology needs something to be digitized to move it along that blockchain technology, but they're fundamentally very different things. Cryptocurrency 
Also, it's not legal tender. It's not backed by a government. The value of this is really just supported by the laws of supply and demand. So in order to use that blockchain technology, you have to digitize something. In the land of cryptocurrency, it's digitizing these, um, this value that's supported by laws of supply and demand so that you can move that digitized medium of exchange along the blockchain. So one's a technology and one is a use case of that technology. Thanks, Amy. That, that's very helpful. Hey, hey, Will, can you maybe speak a little bit to the key, agree, key ingredients to a blockchain and spend a little time on that? Sure. Sure. So I, I alluded to a, a number of them, um, the, the first of which is clearly a peer-to-peer -peer network, so some way to communicate the transactions and the ledger entries a, across a, a group of uh, companies or entities or people, and so you need to have a network. Now, uh, the, the rise of blockchain, we, we didn't go into much of the history earlier, but it, it parallels the um, access to the Internet. And so as more and more computers came onto the Internet, um, it became easier and easier to access a large peer-to-peer -peer network. And so that was that is fundamentally a, a key ingredient. Even if you end up with a blockchain implementation that maybe isn't public, and we'll talk about that in a second, you would still always need to have uh, some network capacity because you are trying to keep this ledger updated in near real time. And so, it's, you know, if you did this by uh, smoke signals or letters, it, it just wouldn't work. Um, you need to be able to digitally transfer the information, as, as Amy mentioned. The second uh, key ingredient is cryptography. Because you've uh, publicized these ledger entries, um, if we just publicize ledger entries as we're used to them as, a, as accountants, uh, it, they contain lots of information that is very private and confidential. Um, you certainly want, wouldn't want everyone to know uh, the names of all the parties who were uh, completing transactions, um, depending on what those transactions are. And so the blockchains uh, don't have to, but in many cases have a cryptography built into them. And so everyone is given a cryptographic address in the blockchain as opposed to an email address or a username. And when you create a cryptographic address on a blockchain, uh, you're given a, a key that would unlock it. And as long as you possess that key, you're able to use that, that wallet address. What's really important here is that these are very complicated cryptographic um, calculations that are occurring, and they need to happen in real time. So this key ingredient is facilitated by the speed of processing power of computers. And as we've been able to um, automate the encryption and um, bring that to you know, the general public, that makes possible to be able to encrypt and decrypt information on a blockchain very quickly while all this consensus process is occurring. And then finally is the consensus mechanism itself. And so one of the questions that we get is, well, who decides the rules? Um, I mentioned validations. Well, who, who made, those, made those up? And the answer is not entirely clear in all cases. Uh, when we think about something like Bitcoin, the, the validation rules were established in a white paper that was anonymously published, and then someone took those validation rules and put them into software. Um, there are other implementations, other use cases that where companies might come together and decide on the validation rules and the manner in which they'll gain consensus over the entries to the, to the ledger. Here I mentioned specifically the, the proof of work type of um, validation. And effectively what that says is, we're going to create uh, an economic competition. And the way you win that competition is by expending more and more uh, energy, i.e. work, to solve a random puzzle. And if you're the first one to solve the random puzzle, we're going to reward you with um, some compensation. And that random puzzle, by solving it, you actually happen to validate all the, the data in the blockchain at the same time. So that was one mechanism by which uh, some of the first blockchains have been implemented, but other types of consensus protocols are being developed that uh, maybe replace or supplant the, the proof of work, but that is a key ingredient. Thanks, Will. That's very helpful. Now, Amy, you, you just talked about what the difference between blockchain and crypto was, but as I understand it, blockchain comes in a number of different flavors. Could you maybe speak to, speak to that? 
Sure. On the next slide, we show the the, the three different flavors. So, and I in our holiday theme here, I would say we have vanilla, pumpkin spice, and uh, peppermint here. So, very different flavors of the different types of blockchain. So first we'll start with with public. I mean the real difference here with with these types of blockchains is a determination of which parties are allowed access to the distributed ledger. So with our public blockchains, it's permissionless. Any party um, it has, that has access to the internet can really have access to these public blockchains. So this is where our blockchain that underscores Bitcoin, that's where this lands, is in this public blockchain. So if you have connection to the internet, you could get access to this public blockchain. It is permissionless. Then we move toward the right side of the spectrum and we have our two types of permissioned blockchains. So we have the one in the middle, which is our hybrid approach. And this, these are more, most likely set up by consortiums of parties that collectively benefit uh, from the blockchain. So you, this group will have pre-selected consensus mechanisms, so the validation mechanisms that Will had just spoke to. It will be pre-selected by the group of parties that are on this permissioned blockchain. All the participants agree to the rule set. They all agree to the validation mechanisms. They agree to the transaction costs that are set up, and then they collectively benefit from the permissioned blockchain. There are a number of use cases here that we've that we've seen in different industries, um, real estate having um, transactions and land and homes all on a on a particular blockchain that would fall into this group of permissioned blockchains a number of use cases in in that space that are very different than the use case of of bitcoin and, and the public blockchain and then on the far right are true private blockchains where it requires permission um, for all parties to it. There's only one centralized authority that can make the changes. So as opposed to the, the hybrid, this one you only have one uh, centralized authority that makes the changes rather than a pre-selected set of, of folks that would be able to make those changes. So it has a lot of protections from privacy, but more limited use cases. And, and really you might not even need a, a blockchain in these situations because it is highly centralized within one party, so it takes away a lot of the benefits that Will had spoken about related to using a blockchain and a distributed ledger across multiple parties. So most of the use cases that we're seeing are in that middle bucket of true hybrid permissioned blockchains where you have a pre-selected group that all can agree to the different rule sets, the consensus mechanisms, the transaction cost, and form a consortium of parties that collectively benefit. Thanks, Amy. Let me follow up with, with one more question, Amy. Um, you do have, I think, an, an audience of accountants here today. And what I always look for is try to find accounting analogies that allows us to provide, to put these things in context. In particular, how, how would a blockchain ledger interface with a company's own accounting system? Would it, would it make things easier? Would it replace people? Would it replace systems? How does it all play together? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Dan, and I think it really depends on the blockchain and how the company is using the blockchain for their particular business. I mean, there's a number of benefits of, of blockchain and how it can help companies execute transactions, because if we go back to the definition of, of blockchain and what it's used for, it's used for the transfer of value of something. So would it replace an entire general ledger? Likely not. Um, could it be helpful in moving transactions and engaging with customers and suppliers? Absolutely. So I, I think the, the two big benefits for, for companies, I mean, one, it's near real-time settlement of transactions, so you'll have a reduced risk that um, that a party won't pay. Um, and then it allows participants to really transact directly with each other, so it eliminates the need for a centralized transaction processor, so things are, are faster and more efficient. Um, so some, some ways it can be used, you could store record of the transaction. Now, this would be um, a record that the transaction occurred, and it would show that, that all of the, the protocols were met and, it, and the transaction occurred and was valid, you likely wouldn't have all of the contracts and everything behind that stored in the blockchain because we go back to what Will said, that anything that's on the blockchain, others can see it because everybody has the exact same um, view of that particular ledger. So you likely wouldn't store all of those contracts. You would have that in your enterprise database. But 
Um, you could use this as a great mechanism for storing a record of the transaction. Its use case that's used right now with, with Bitcoin and there's other use cases is moving records of value. So you can move value across parties in a very quick way. And then smart contracts is, is an interesting use case from a business perspective. Um, really thinking about are there ways to put programs into into the system that will trigger transfer value under certain conditions. So these if then statements that will allow for automatic execution of um, of transfer of value upon conditions being met. And that could really speed things up. But to answer your question, is it, I don't think it will ever replace management's books and records and systems that they currently have in place to, to account for their transactions. This is a mechanism to carry out those transactions, but it's not gonna likely replace a management's books and records and everything they currently have in place to support their books and records. Thanks, Amy. You know, I was sitting in a conversation today relative to investment management and the like, and we did come across some interesting applications for for whatever we want to call it, blockchain. And that was one of the things that auditors need to do when they're dealing with investment management and the like is look at purchases and sales of securities along the way. And as Amy said, you have a transaction by transaction ledger that shows purchases and sales of those securities. In an ideal world, a custodian or a transfer agent actually has a record of the securities and their own in and out of those securities. So in theory, you could match up this, this distributed ledger that the custodian had to the transactions that you had in your ledger and essentially audit what was going on. So I think as we try and we see new things coming on board, there are multiple, multiple ways that we can we, be, we can be using it and apply it along the way. So Will, I'm going to come back to you um, for a second and just ask you sort of a big picture question in terms of what would you regard the true value of, of, of blockchain to be? And where would you expect the adoption to be more aggressive? Sure, sure. And just to play off a little bit of what uh, you and Amy both just, both just said, um, when you have a situation where you have lots of intermediaries and you've, um, you're doing reconciliation, you know, the value of, of blockchain is to help you automate that process. So let's let's take an example. Um, the current state and how we manage data, because we at the very beginning we said this was was all about data. In the current state, um, you have customers or, or counterparties that are interacting with businesses through a variety of different processes, and, and most businesses have developed their own set of systems uh, to interact with those customers. And once they collect data on those customers, um, they re record that data into their traditional databases and uh, keep that data. Now we know uh, in today's world that data is a tremendous asset. And so there's a lot of value in, in holding that data. Um, if this graph, this picture on the screen were, were really true to form, you would actually see behind it, behind these data silos, a lot of accountants who are spending time reconciling between these, these different businesses because that's what uh, businesses have to do to reconcile um, their accounts receivable or accounts payable or margin positions. Um, and there, any transaction that becomes um, potentially contested, you start to go through the process of, of reconciliation. And that reconciliation is, is time consuming because it's effectively hunting through these data silos to find the, the items that you know, didn't flow through the processes the same way for one reason or another, or maybe one set of processes was slightly different than another. With blockchain, it's, it's flipping it. We're saying, well, the customers would interact with this a single set of uh, data, and it's distributed amongst many different players, so everyone has access to it. But on the very front end, we're going to get to data standardization. And once we get to data standardization, now on the back end, there's not a need necessarily to have the reconciliation points between entities because we're dealing with a single source of truth. And that's, that's really where the value to an enterprise is with blockchain. This is also the most difficult thing to uh, achieve because in order to achieve this, you have to have agreement. 
on what those things are that you're going to capture. And so when we see challenges in adopting blockchain, it usually comes from the fact that uh, the enterprises can't get together and decide, well, these are the things we want to track in a standardized distributed ledger. And this is how we're going to do it. So reaching that conclusion is the hard work. And once you've reached that conclusion, implementing it in a technology framework and then taking advantage of it is a little bit easier. But it's very, very valuable because it creates this common data platform, which you can then use to build advanced analytics, um, even artificial intelligence on top of. Now, I will mention that the other challenge with this, and to Amy's point about why it probably won't replace enterprise-wide systems, is that clearly in a distributed network, you are tracking data uh, redundantly. So maybe today I've got a, a file that is uh, you know, 100 megabytes, and I've got one version of it and copy of it in my, in my system. Well, if I replicate that file into a blockchain with 10,000 nodes, now I have that file 10,000 times 100 megabytes, whatever that is, in data storage. Blockchain tries to, to answer that problem by saying, well, the cost of data storage is going down over time. So as data storage costs decrease, then more and more things can be tracked on the blockchain. But the reality of it is, is as data storage costs decrease, we find more and more things to store. And so the idea that we'd ever take all the data that's now being collected by enterprises and replicate that across huge blockchain networks um, is a little bit crazy because you would, um, you would incur so much cost. And so what's really important is to figure out amongst the parties who are entering into these business transactions, what is the data that would be valuable to standardize? And then use the blockchain to track that information amongst the consortium and eliminate some of the back-end processes for reconciliation and build out analytics and artificial intelligence um, in a more comprehensive way for those, those areas. Thanks, Will. Amy, I just want to try and round out the blockchain topic and ask you to perhaps highlight the items that are most important to consider. And while you're at it, uh, bust some myths and some general untruths that tend to circulate in the media about blockchain. Sure thing, Dan, and I think we've touched on all four of these, so I'll go through them quickly. But uh, the, the four big myths we have with, with blockchain and, and Bitcoin, the first one uh, we hear all the time that blockchain is Bitcoin. So the first myth that, that I hope to bust is that blockchain is not Bitcoin. Blockchain is our underlying technology. Bitcoin is one use case. Beyond that, there's a number of other use cases for the technology. So myth number one is blockchain is Bitcoin, that is false. Um, the next is blockchain is not an enterprise database. I think Will covered this really well with, with and expanded on the discussion on data storage costs and, and, and why this wouldn't be used. And also I think it gets back to too, you wouldn't necessarily want to store some private information or large amounts of companies' data on, um, on a blockchain because others can see it. It, it is distributed by its nature. Um, so blockchain is not an enterprise database. Uh, the third one, blockchain security does not mean inherent data privacy. So we hear a lot about blockchain security um, and how if everybody has the same view of, of the distributed ledger and the protocols are set up quick or appropriately, um, we have the security there because everybody sees every transaction, they're being validated, we're comfortable with the validation protocols. That does not translate to data privacy because again, everybody's seeing the same ledger and so it, it isn't private. Um, everybody can see what's, what's put on there and so it's important to understand the difference between the blockchain security and data privacy. Um, and then the last one is that blockchain is not always public so that the use cases that we often hear are the blockchains that are underlying the cryptocurrencies, um, Bitcoin and others, but there are a number of other types of, of blockchains out there that can be quite powerful um, and, and really help with the transfer of, of different types of assets and, and different types of value. So I think that's an important one to understand is that blockchain is not always the public blockchains that are, that are in the press every day, but that there's a number of other types of use cases for this technology. Well, thanks, Aim, very, very much. And and now I think that would that sort of exhausts the blockchain topic, or at least at least lets everybody's appetite relative to it. And to me, I always think about the blockchain. About 35 years ago, I remember thinking about 
FOB shipping point and FOB destination, and there were all these goods at the end of the year floating around there that nobody had on their books. So finally, I think we can reconcile those things uh, through, through a shared blockchain some, somewhere down the road. But let, let's move on to something that gets all the, pro, all the press and a topic that seems to be top of mind everywhere. And of course, my two sons decided that they wanted to speculate in cryptocurrency, and they held those positions for about a month, and then they got out of that quickly. So can, can you describe again, Amy, what a digital asset is or what, a, what cryptocurrency is and why it's such a hot topic right now? Sure. So simply put, anything that exists in a binary format that has a right to use can be digitized and stored and traded digitally on a blockchain. So cryptocurrency is, is the one that we often hear about that, that is digitized. But we could digitize anything. We could digitize art. We could digitize real estate. Uh, we had in the press about digitizing mangoes so that we could track mangoes from point A to B to C to D and see how the mangoes are moving. So you really could digitize anything to be able to allow it to work on a blockchain. Um, some examples of digital assets and different categories of digital assets, we have our digital tokens. So this is a type of digital asset that represents an asset or a utility um, that can be transacted on a blockchain. There's three broad categories of, of these types of tokens. And I say categories, but there is so much gray between these categories that it's important to really think about what the business purpose is that's driving the particular token. So one of those is a security token. So this is a category of token that may represent financial instruments such as debt or equity claim on an issuer. Um, there is some economic function to them, and they could be potentially analogous to equities or bonds or derivatives. They could have rights to them. Um, there's utility tokens. This category of tokens provides or promises access to some goods or services. So you're going to get some utility out of this particular token that you purchase. And there's a lot of gray between securities and, and security tokens and utility tokens. And that's where it's really important to think about the business purpose. Why is somebody buying this token? What is it actually being used for? And then the third category of tokens is um, one that represents legal title in some form to an underlying asset. So this might be a token that represents uh, real estate or um, a good that's a package or something that's in transit. So this is tied to a particular underlying asset. So it goes back to in order to use a blockchain, you need to digitize something. And these are some broad categories that you may be able to digitize within. But there's a lot of gray between these, these categories, and it gets back to what's the business purpose. And then we get to cryptocurrencies, and we talked about this a little bit, but cryptocurrencies, it's a digital or virtual medium of exchange. Um, they, again, they're, they're not backed by government. They're not um, legal tender, and so they're not a form of fiat. Uh, their value is really driven by supply and, and demand, but those are a form of, um, of virtual value to transact on a particular blockchain. Thanks, Ayn. Well, maybe what you could do is, is, is give an idea for us of what the, the ecosystem looks like and who the big players are in, in this whole crypto consortium or whatever we want to call it. Yeah, sure. So we, I think we've established, hopefully, that blockchain is not an entity. And so uh, we can't say things like... Um, well, just go out to the blockchain and, and buy Bitcoin uh, because the blockchain has no way to take your dollars. <laughs> it, it, it can track the Bitcoin, but it, it doesn't do anything with dollars, for example. So blockchain is, is, a blockchain is purely a data storage, a ledger that is tracking one of the, the asset types that Amy just mentioned. And so because that's there, so even it's not an entity, it, it is an asset of itself. Um, a ledger is, is valuable. And so what we have is... Um, a number of businesses that have built up business processes around blockchains to perform some of these functions that are really important to make make things work. And so maybe you, maybe you start with um, an exchange. So you have a, a business that has come into being that says, I will, I will actually give you some Bitcoin in exchange for dollars. And, and that's one type of business. 
And then along with that, you have a, a place where you can maybe trade uh, those types of currencies and maybe even enter into financial transactions related to those, to those currencies. So you can, uh, along the cryptocurrency lines, you start to see businesses pop up who are helping to manage the customer interaction with the blockchain. Um, because, like I said, you can't just go out and, and decide to uh, buy Bitcoin for dollars from no one. Now, along with that, we have a number of um, companies that are investing. And so they look at different digital assets as a way to hold value. And as Amy mentioned, sometimes digital assets are um, actually rights to other assets. You know, that there have been coins or tokens that have been created that represent the right to precious metals, for example. And so maybe a way to get access to investing in precious metals is to buy that token. And so you have funds who have put together investment dollars to, to buy into those assets. You, of course, have the companies that um, are in the space of actually building the software. So back to the question of well, who uh, sets up the rules and how do we create the, the digital backbone behind all of this to make it all work? Um, I think, you know, we've been asked the question, is this all just conceptual or is this something that's real? And the answer is it's real because people have taken the conceptual ideas and turned them into software and now are implementing that software in real, in real business processes. Maybe the first one um, with Bitcoin was a kind of Internet collective crowdsourced project and you know, done, quote unquote, free um, by, you know, some from freelancers. But going forward, you have you have software companies. Um, in fact, many of the big names have announced blockchain platforms and different types of software accelerators that allow you to create um, blockchains for your purpose. And so that, that is part of the, the marketplace as well. And then finally, you, you have a group of companies that are performing the validation themselves. And so going back to the public blockchains, in order to perform the validation, there's an economic competition that's occurring. And so you have companies that exist to do the calculations, to uh, validate the transactions, to agree that the blocks are correct and receive economic compensation for that. You, you frequently hear about those as, as miners is the, the kind of the term in the industry, um, but essentially those are, are companies that are set up purely to, to validate the transactions before they're, they're written to the ledger. So we, we'd see um, a whole ecosystem that's you know being created around this as uh, both consumers and uh, other legacy businesses put together use cases and start to um, and start to adopt this technology. Uh, but there certainly is a need, because it's decentralized, to have a business that manages the relationship between the blockchain and uh, the customer. And so that, that has certainly become one of the bigger places. Thanks, Will, very much. Now, Amy, I, I guess it's fitting that I asked this question. <laughs> is crypto auditable? Should, should investors be worrying about a cryptocurrency asset that's sitting on a balance sheet? And, and what sort of regulatory concerns are there that are currently being expressed? And, and I know that there are many of these things. And I know, I know you've had a number of experiences recently. So please, if you could help folks out on that, that'd be great. Sure thing, Dan. Challenging question. Um, and I think it's important, I mean, I, I always say that it's important to go back to the business purpose of the particular entity. So Will walked us through the different types of entities in this ecosystem. And to evaluate if you can audit them, it's really under, important to understand their particular business purpose. How are they playing in the ecosystem? How are they maintaining their books and records? Understand the nature of the underlying blockchain. So we, we talked very fundamentally of that there's there's different blockchains and each of those blockchains may have the nature of the blockchain might be different. There's different agreements between the parties underlying the blockchain. There's likely different consensus mechanisms as to how transactions get validated. Um, automated controls that the company has that's maybe in the blockchain, also how the company has automated controls that they reconcile to the blockchain. And, and very fundamentally, how do they maintain their books and records? Are they, are they doing other reconciliations with the blockchain? What are they doing to, to make sure that they're comfortable with, with the data? And so when we're assessing if something's auditable, it's really important to, to get behind the particular entity, understand their business purpose, understand 
the nature of their underlying blockchain technology. And all of that is going to be able to help you answer, one, is it auditable? And then, two, when you get to the answer, if you get to the answer, yes, it is, what are the risks that you're concerned about? And how do you perform an appropriate risk assessment? And then that's going to drive your, your response. And so on the slide, I have a couple areas that are particularly important in, in this ecosystem when we think about auditing these types of companies. Um, starting with fraud risks, it's, it's a unique space. I think there's, there's likely going to be some unique opportunities and methods that, that entities could perpetrate, entities and individuals could perpetrate fraud. And so it's important to really think about, I mean, I walked through some of the things to think about with a particular blockchain, um, but really get into what are those opportunities and um, new methods that fraud could be perpetrated. On the flip side, there's likely some traditional fraud schemes that, that all of us auditors um, have top of mind for traditional companies that may not be an opportunity for, for fraud in this ecosystem. So I think that's really important to think about the unique considerations in this space. Um, we talked about the general ledger and, and, and how blockchain might intersect with the general ledger. Um, again, I think that's going to get back to each um, particular enterprise and, and how they're taking the data that's stored on the blockchain and reconciling it and how it's going to fit into their systems of, of their financial s statements and, and um, systems. And so I think it's important to understand that transaction flow to be able to set up an appropriate audit of the financial statements. Um, the anonymous nature of the, the blockchain is, is interesting, and I think there's, there's a lot of focus on, on this area. Um, and, and again, it depends on the particular blockchain. I mean, certain block blockchains, if we, if we think about like the Bitcoin blockchain, are set up with public addresses. So you won't necessarily know Amy Steele when you're transacting with me, but you would have my public address. And so it, it tends to be more of a pseudo-anonymous nature to the blockchain um, where you, I would need to give you my public address to transact with me um, in order to do that transaction. And so I think there's important things for management to evaluate here and for auditors to evaluate as to how do you know who you're transacting with? What are your controls over it? What are your procedures and processes to do? Know your customer and anti-money laundering and whatnot. So I think some unique considerations in the space to really think about um, who you're transacting with and make sure that management has the appropriate controls in place to, to be able to mitigate against fraud-related parties um, and engaging with any legal acts. And then um, the last area I wanted to point out is um, audit evidence. So, and we see this just generally, I think, as auditors, as, as, um, as data, mechanisms of data storage and transactions um, changes over time, the types of evidence that we get is different. And so it's important here in a blockchain situation to really think about the evidence and is it going to be sufficient and appropriate for the particular audit. Um, and again, I think a lot of it is going to also come down to management's controls and how they get comfortable with the data. Um, because the blockchain, while it's a very powerful tool for transacting um, value and, and data, it's not going to solve the, the fundamental issues that we always have with any sort of data storage, that if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So it's important to really understand the, the mechanisms that management has in place to, to make sure that the information is, is good information and reliable information. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I'll talk about a few unique areas of focus from a financial statement assertion perspective. So if we start with existence of assets, um, the challenge here is that in many cases, the underlying record of the transaction, it sits on the blockchain without any physical representation of the transaction. So um, a lot of assets, how we test existence is we go and we look at it. So if the client says they have a computer, I can go and I could look at the computer and see that it exists. Here, if they say they have a Bitcoin, it's a lot more challenging um, because there isn't a physical representation of that particular Bitcoin. Um, so it's, it presents some unique uh, challenges for the auditor. Um, some companies may use a third-party custodian, and so there's, um, there's that help that you could potentially confirm with a custodian. Um, some of these custodians do have controls attestation reports, but there's some unique challenges to think about from the existence of these digitized assets. Rights and obligations is also a very interesting um, assert, financial statement assertion that we think about in the space. Because um, if we think about 
for our public blockchains and our, our cryptocurrencies, ownership of a private key equals ownership of the asset. So if you don't have the private key, you likely don't own the asset. So if, it's lo if you lost the private key, if it's stolen, if it's corrupted, and it can't be recovered, the entity will no longer be able to access that digital asset. And so it's no longer to able to establish ownership. ownership. So it's a very unique area to think about how, do, how does management uh, make sure that they always have ownership of these private keys? How do they test it? What are their controls and processes? And then from an auditor perspective, how do we audit that? Um, so a fun fun space to, to evaluate there. Um, related parties, illegal acts and fraud, this I touched on on the prior slide. Um, it's really thinking through the, the potential challenges related to the pseudo-anonymous um, nature. The, the information such as names um, can't necessarily be determined by looking at just the public address on the blockchain. However, there are links between that public address and the identity of participants in the transaction. So, for example, you might be able to get that link through exchanges or um, custodians and, and those types of services. So it's just a, um, very important for auditors and, and management to really think about the controls and how they're protecting, how management is protecting their books and records from illegal acts and fraud and that they're not engaging in related party transactions. And then valuation, um, so valuation, this is the risk that a digital asset is valued using inappropriate techniques or models um, or that there's potential manipulation of the value due to a lack of liquidity and regulation. So here it's really important to understand management's process for valuing these assets um, and what those models are. We might need to involve specialists in this area. Um, it's a unique area. There, we don't have a lot of authoritative guidance on how to value. Um, and there, there are some questions um, and, and challenges related to the liquidity of these assets. And it really depends on the type of digital asset it is. Um, is it more frequently traded? Is it not? Because we talk a lot about Bitcoin, but that's one of, of many, many, many uh, digital assets. And so it's important to understand the nature of the particular digital asset and then the methods and models and techniques that are being used to, to value that digital asset. But definitely a financial statement assertion that is top of mind um, in this space. Yeah, Dan, and I, I think those are um, really great audit risks. Uh, there, uh, Amy mentioned a little bit earlier, there's also the, the business risks associated with, with using uh, blockchains. And in particular, we, we kind of skimmed the surface on uh, privacy versus um, security, and it probably bears a little bit more attention. So what does that mean? Um, and, you know, if you go out and you, you do get a wallet and you do get a, a, a key to that wallet and they're, they are encryption encrypted a set of information, then you might have a feeling that, in fact, it is it is private because you're the only person who has that key. And because of that, um, there's no way for someone to know that this random string of digits that's buried in this blockchain uh, relates back to you. And so that that is true. And I think Amy used a really good word on pseudo-anonymous because as long as no one can link you to those random string of digits, then it's true. It is um, anonymous. However, if someone ever were to be able to link you to those random string of digits, they would then have a complete transaction record for as long as you were doing transactions on that particular blockchain because the blockchain itself is immutable. So if you went through and you did lots of legitimate transactions and had one illegitimate transaction, and years down the line, someone uh, was able to connect you, know, you as a company or as a person to that particular account, they would be able to see all the transactions because once it's decrypted for whatever reason, and it may not be a factor of breaking decryption um, using quantum computing or, or some other method, it may be simple trickery to find out who, what your Bitcoin wallet addresses are. But once it's decrypted, everything is laid bare for all to see. And so when we think about uh, the digital world and having distributed ledgers, you know, companies need to be very thoughtful about what is the information that we're going to store in these distributed ledgers. Because while we can go a long way to try to protect uh, the privacy or ensure the privacy, um, once it's out there, it's never never coming back. Uh, for that reason, um, you know, some of the use cases that I, I foresee in the future have more to do with certifying authenticity of things, 
than actually storing data. In fact, you might want to store the data someplace where you have more confidence that it will never see um, the light of day outside of your, your entity because that data is such a valuable asset. But you might want to use the blockchain to timestamp it and put a record of authenticity on that data so that if uh, someone in the future changed that data, you would know it. Um, this becomes particularly important when we look at what uh, what people are able to do these days with um, tampering with evidence like pho photography, video, et cetera. How can you trust that something is original? And one of the ways you can do that is by creating a timestamp on a blockchain that can't be changed. So I, I think that there's a lot of potential use for an immutable ledger, but there's also risks that people should be aware of. And I think people are becoming aware of them as uh, they start to realize that maybe their cryptocurrency gains, or in the case of your children, maybe losses, Dan, uh, you have to pay taxes. So uh, as that starts to happen, um, I think we're recognizing that these pseudo-anonymous solutions uh, can very quickly become uh, non-anonymous. Thanks, Bob. That's very helpful. And, you know, as, as I reflect back on what we've talked about today and as I've, we reflect it back on all these articles that we see out there, and being an audit dinosaur to some degree, does a 97% number seem to ring true to me? And when we're thinking about a set of financial statements, there are certainly things that a blockchain can, can deal with. And it, that are basically the normal cycles. It can deal with receivables and straightforward sales of widgets. And it can deal with payable transactions or payroll transactions alike. But what blockchain can't do and what it can't supplant and what we all do on a day-to-day -day basis is deal with those estimates that reside in financial statements and that are so dependent on judgment by management and judgment by auditors along the way. So, you know, as we reflect upon this, it really seems to me that blockchain's a great thing to have. It's something that, 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 that that's around to stay but it does not supplant us as auditors along the way. So, so what I'd like to do is, um, again, thank Will and Amy for the time they spent with us today. We hope that this has been informative and has allowed you to contextualize and differentiate blockchain from crypto from digital assets. When I think about crypto, I, I, I dragged a quote out that said if people value something it has value if people do not value something it doesn't have value there's no intrinsic about it so you think many many years ago people used to look at fiat paper currencies and laugh intending that the only store of value or something that had intrinsic value was gold and now people look at digital assets and also laugh contending that they perhaps have no intrinsic value. Yet, I think only time will tell whether cryptocurrencies supplant fiat currencies or become some other significant method of exchange. Technology adapts and find its, finds its highest and best use. And it's usually not where somebody predicted. Blockchain itself does and will likely find many best uses. We started this, this, this discussion again today with, with a fairly bold assertion, audit is dead. And, and for that matter, if we read the press, fiat currency isn't far behind. This is really part of that blockchain hyperbole out there. Yet blockchain does exist and it has relevance in many areas. The technology has many unique applications. The technology may revolutionize certain things, but it's certainly not a panacea for all the ills in the world. We as management, auditors, investors, and regulators, we all have a role in looking beyond the hype in understanding this new technology exploiting it appropriately, and managing the risks associated with it. We thank you again for joining us this afternoon, and please have a good rest of the day.
This does conclude our presentation for today. Thanks to Dan, Will, and Amy for an excellent presentation. You can find their contact information in the speaker bio tool to the left of your screen. <clears throat> when we close in a moment, the screen will redirect to our user survey. We really appreciate your valuable feedback. This webinar will be available in archive in about an hour at the same link as the live webinar. So feel free to come back and review any of the content or invite colleagues that you feel might find it valuable or interesting. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.